Good afternoon. My name is Christopher Smith, and I'm one of the research associates at the Center for Ethics as part of the Race, Ethics, and Power uh, Project. And welcome to our capstone event, Unbound Questions, Ethical Interventions, which brings together our uh, our uh, this year's fellows that are affiliated with the project. And so to give you a sense of what you can anticipate today, this gathering brings together undergraduate and graduate fellows, as well as uh, research associates, as they share their current scholarly, <clears throat> as they share their current scholarly work as part of the project. As an interdisciplinary collective of researchers, the presentations offer interventions across a variety of fields of study to address ethical concerns regarding methodology and practice. And so with that, I will leave it to my colleague uh, Vasuki to uh, lead us off with the first panel. Thank you, Christopher. Um, welcome, everybody. We also want to um, say thank you for the Center for Ethics for hosting. Um, and we're really excited uh, for this small conference because is sharing some of the work that we've been um, involved with throughout the year. Uh, and so for the first presentation, um, I have the pleasure of introducing Chelsea. Um, Chelsea's research will center around the ethics of research in Indigenous communities and the ways it should be conducted in order to preserve and strengthen Indigenous ecological knowledge and culture drawing from guidelines such as Linda Smith decolonizing methodologies, which uses Kaupapa Maori as an approach to culturally appropriate research protocols and methodologies. Uh, she wishes to evaluate the impacts of colonial research and how to decolonize current indigenous ecological uh, approaches to conduct it for extraction and the expansion of Western knowledge. So when it comes to indigenous ecological knowledge, how can extractivism occur with, uh, with knowledge? How should indigenous ecological knowledge research be conducted? And when considering cultural layering. Uh, and to give you a quick bio of her work as well. Um, um, Chelsea is an undergraduate student at U of T studying political science, environmental studies, and a minor in environmental ethics. Um, this year, she's an undergraduate fellow with the Race Ethics Power Project. Through her position as a fellow, she hopes to broaden her knowledge and research interests in intersectionalities between climate justice, race, and ethics, and exploring the ways that political governance and hegemonic structures of racial inequality shape societal movements. During her free time, Chelsea enjoys snacking while curled up on the couch with a good book and movie. Um, Chelsea, please take it away. Great, thank you so much for that introduction, um, Basuki, and thank you for opening this panel. Uh, um, sorry, Basuki. Oh, okay, there we go. Sorry, I think my video cut off for a moment. Um, but yes, thank you uh, also, Chris, for opening this uh, panel, um, this conference, I'm really excited to be doing a little brief uh, description of my research and my paper. Um, so the title of my paper is Researching Indigeneity, um, and it's focused on looking at ethical research um, practices and processes uh, specifically related to Indigenous ecological knowledge um, for the purposes of Indigenous autonomy, self-determination, and self uh, and self-control over the research so that it's for Indigenous people instead of um, on Indigenous people. And so to start, I sort of want to introduce one of the main influences that got me into doing this paper. And that is a wonderful book uh, by Linda Tui Smith called Decolonizing Methodologies. Um, I recommend it to anyone who really wants to learn more about sort of um, understanding decolonization and understanding the methodologies that are utilized in the Western societies to further, you know, gain knowledge about what are ways to understand indigenous, indigenous practices and ways to, um, and, and ways to sort of learn about it in a very respectful manner. So um, this book sort of inspired this project and uh, Linda Tui-Smith really talked about some of the implications of research and 
you know, focused mainly in Western indigenous peoples and their communities. Um, she personally wrote this book after struggling to develop uh, meaningful research for her own community as an indigenous individual and wanting to develop ideas that would help her community and their development instead of only solely for the purposes of a research project. Um, and this really resonated with me as I found um, wanting to, I found myself wanting to do something not only for indigenous communities, um, you know, from my position as a settler in Canada, but also because of my background, um, my Asian background, uh, specifically from my maternal grandmother who um, originates from the Yao community in Southeast Asia and has, you know, had this really rich heritage and um, culture behind her background and something that I've not personally grown up with, but something that I've explored more as I've grown, as I've grown older. Um, and so indigenous cultures and heritage, I found, seems to have many um, interlinkings and I found many parallels and, and many similarities and differences in policies, um, governance and research conducted in, in, in her community, in the Yao community, in Southeast Asian indigenous peoples communities and in those communities in Canada in indigenous peoples here. Um, so I wanted to really explore, you know, how is research conducted in both Canada globally in various contexts in various communities and what are the ways that it could be better conducted so that people are not just being experimented on, researched on, but rather experimented for. Um, so yeah, historically, um, as probably many people know, indigenous peoples have been uh, very have been subject to very exploitative conditions, um, either because of living in a uh, living on land that was colonized by settlers, um, often in North America, or because they um, are stripped of their self determination, self recognition, and self autonomy um, by governance in various countries, um, which also occurs even without the colonial context that a lot of Western countries have. Um, and so I wanted to sort of look at the similarities of parallels and evaluate how we can really format ethical research and how ethical research guidelines are currently being produced and how they can be furthered. Um, so first I wanted to start with defining indigenous peoples um, as this term is sort of, a, it could be very broadly applied and it could be very narrowly applied depending on the context and for the purposes of this paper and this discussion, I sort of want to apply it in a very global sense and looking at how this can sort of unify the experiences of many people who've experienced not just colonization, but also oppression from governments, um, from systemic, you know, um, formats within society, um, and just being stripped of their ability to inhabit their native lands without, you know, without um, interruptions, without, without being suppressed. Um, so, as Linda Smith mentioned in her book, indigenous peoples in this title itself brings power and recognition to people. And it sort of collectivizes the struggles that a lot of people, indigenous peoples worldwide face. Um, so not only does this term internationalize experiences and the unique struggles that many of the peoples who are colonized and who are oppressed face around the world, but it also um, works strategically to sort of um, build and rebuild this community to build people together and to sort of learn and grow with the with each other to sort of you know create this environment that's even better and uplifts more people and and communities all around the world um, and in relation to indigenous peoples i also want to define indigeneity so indigeneity um it's not always the context and the definition is also very vague. It could defer, but in this context, um, I'm going to specifically be referencing the definition uh, brought forth by Thornberry, who states that indigeneity is the unlimited right to self-identification by indigenous peoples. So this means that, um, you know, it doesn't only apply within the colonial context. After all, recognition of indigenous groups can be, as I mentioned, um, equated with political inequalities, economic inequalities, social inequalities that result from a difference in access to resources, to power um, within a society. And so this, this 
provides a really broad context and further sort of illustrates the importance of indigenous identity for people around the world. And um, although indigeneity can be sort of framed within a very top down hegemonic uh, viewpoint, I'm going to be focusing on the so more of a sociocultural bottom up um, expression of culture and looking at sociocultural practices that indigenous people inhabit themselves. Um, so, as I mentioned, I uh, want to really look at some of the current ethical practices that are ongoing, and many of it is focused within uh, Western contexts. So, a lot of the ethical research procedures and guidelines are mostly constructed within countries like Canada and uh, the US, and by agencies such as the Tri Council uh, funding agencies, which are uh, in Canada, such as the CIHR. Um, and they usually have very broad frameworks that allow you to sort of understand how to go about Indigenous research in ways that are ethical, in ways that are determined and disseminated by Indigenous peoples. Um, and some of these guidelines, uh, just briefly illustrating some of these guidelines, are things like allowing Indigenous communities to the rights to select their preferred method of data collection, um, allowing the research practices to meet the demands and needs of these communities and better incorporating indigenous values and beliefs ways and ways of knowing by facilitating research that is collaborative, respectful, and relational. Um, and I believe that a key aspect of being able to do all these three uh, main framework ideas is facilitating research through understanding and ex extensive understanding of the role that indigenous history, culture, and language plays in their identity. Um, and so looking at some of the Western methodologies that are specifically applied with this broad framework in mind, um, some, one of some of the most popular are um, autoethnography, which is sort of telling your own story, telling your own culture, and really just like allowing the person who's being interviewed or being, uh, yeah, who's being interviewed to really take center stage and to determine what they want to say and how they want to say it. Um, they often blend this autoethnography sort of methodology with um, indigenous research methods and paradigms that are specific to a certain community that is being, that it, the research is occurring on. Um, and so alternatively, there's also um, some research methods that focus on, rather than sort of blending research indigenous practices within a already established sort of Western research method, they really try to formulate um, their research solely around um, indigenous methodologies that are usually quite well established in the community. And one of these is, um, um, and one of the communities that was heavily researched historically and currently is the Maui people, um, specifically the Maui people of New Zealand. And so I will be referencing their um, research methodology specifically um, in this paper. So um, as I mentioned, because of the historical, um, because of the colonial history of having research done onto the Maui people, they have really been trying to focus on um, you know, centralizing the Maori worldview and beliefs so that the research process is reinforced and guided by their own principles um, rather than being guided by Western principles and Western ideologies that are were often very exploitative to their community. Um, and some of the Maori principles that their research is defined by is uh, relationality, self-reflection, and connection. And so these three ideas are really what guides the research process and they have very extensive sort of guidelines and steps and it goes into detail about how they want research to be conducted in a way that respects those guidelines. Um, and so these are some suggestions and examples that I've looked into that I find are good guidelines and good uh, establish a firm basis for looking into ethical research um, and, and could be applied within an international comp, uh, context within you know a global context uh, in countries in Southeast Asia and you know um, in South America and other indigenous communities that may have had less access to such extensive uh, you know extensively research and extensively applied research methods um, and so 
I think that it's really important to really expand the definition of indigenous peoples and indigeneity for this purpose, because the research shouldn't just be limited to Western indigenous peoples or within Western context or within specific communities, but by understanding the relationality between all of these groups and all these communities and understanding how research can be a very collaborative process. You can blend these techniques, but also learn from these techniques and apply them to very specific contexts uh, for the benefit of empowering and uplifting communities and not just um, making sure that the research is not harmful, but also increasing their quality of life and increasing their self-determination as well. Um, yeah, so uh, just a little more on Smith's book because I really loved it is um, one important aspect that Smith's methodology is on indigenous peoples, which she focuses mostly on the Western context um, is uh, the ability to allow them to sort of reclaim their history and to decolonize their present societies. So research can be such a, through reading her book mostly, I realized that research can be such an empowering process, one that doesn't have to be defined by um, purely the basis of understanding something, but also enable people to feel more empowered and making this process not just neutral, but beneficial for indigenous peoples. Um, and so through very, very flexible methods, um, flexibility is very emphasized in these research methods, very uh, through flexibility, through understanding and through just openness to various disciplines, fields of knowledge and ways of knowing, um, research researchers, even outsider researchers can apply, um, can integrate their research into these communities while being respectful, while being, you know, appropriate to their culture and not um, doing anything that could be potentially harmful to these people. Um, so I would love to see some of these policies and some of these practices be further applied in um, Asian countries, in South American countries, and in indigenous communities that are still being exploited, that are still having research unethically conducted, um, and who are still not able to sort of be legitimately legitimately recognized as indigenous peoples and to have these communities be able to be given a voice and to be given an, a further sort of collectivized um, platform to speak out on the issues and also to be better um, to be better protected to be better uplifted by ethical research processes so I think really looking into these different ways and ways that they can be combined was something that I really wanted to do because looking into examples of current guidelines can really help to inform ways that we can make them better and we can also apply them to different contexts around the world. Um, yeah, so that is um, my presentation and thank you for listening. Uh, yes, um, and we will, I think, Wasuki or Christopher? I'll take over. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Chelsea, uh, for that really engaging paper and um, also introducing us to some of the key debates that are happening in scholarship. I am going to ask our next presenter to come online, um, Andrew. Uh, and I'm going to introduce Andrew. Um, Andrew is a queer Jamaican born Canadian settler who has lived much of his life in Canada. However, he now splits his time between Munich, Germany and Toronto, Canada with his partner and two cats, Reds and Pats, while pursuing graduate studies in human geography at the University of Toronto. His interest spans various subjects that include, but is not limited to black feminist thought, post-colonialism, queer color of critique, intersectionality, native studies, philosophy of knowledge, ontology, and affect theory. Through the Race, Ethics, and Power Fellowship, he hopes to interrogate the ethics of understanding racism as primarily as advanced by its advocates, as rooted in implicit bias through which racism and racial hegemony can be dismantled. Um, through the implicit bias test as taken up by many institutions, both here in North America and Europe. During the summers, he works as an English camp counselor and as an ESL facilitator in Munich, Germany, working with children, teens and adults, 
and where he has lived and worked for the last 12 years. Do I, come, do I come on now? Yes. <laughs> okay, it's going to be um, interesting because I like to see people's face, but it's okay. Okay, hello everyone, and thank you, Vasuki, for such a generous introduction. Um, I'm just going to be going over um, my research paper that I've been working on for the last few months. Uh, let me just switch here. So the title of my paper is called, um, I should have scrolled up earlier. <laughs> the title of my paper is called um, Ontological Adduction, Black Geographies and Bodies as a Problem of Thought Within Germany. The overall paper is actually looking at anti-Black racism, but specifically it's looking at a sort of genealogy of uh, racism or anti-Black racism as we now know it. Specifically, the paper is looking at, or the starting point of this paper <clears throat> was a speech given by Angela Merkel in 2010, in which she declared in German that multiculti is absolute gesichert, which would mean multiculturalism is a failure. Um, and in another instance, I think a little bit recently, she said that multiculturalism is a sham. Um, the issue at hand, at least for me in this paper, is not to deny or suggest that people living in Germany do not learn German or speak German customs or laws. However, it is, at least from my perspective, a sort of disavow of and disavow of and vanquishing of differences through forcible integration. Because another part of her speech, she says, Subandara müssen nicht nur die deutschen Gesetze achten, um, or translated as migrants have to learn German laws, German language, and German culture. Interestingly enough, this sort of um, integration is really unidirectional and has a lot of implication for groups that are different to quote unquote Germans. This sort of rhetoric delivered from the highest office in the land represents the white German polity. Um, it is a sentiment that disavows a difference within the German nation state. It is a discourse that is rooted, at least from my perspective in progress, um, excuse me, <clears throat> in progress, which means, according to James Baldwin, progress in this case means how fast one becomes white through the adoption, adaptation of Eurocentric norms, values, culture, aesthetics, mores, et cetera. For me, um, we can understand the chancellor's rhetoric as grounded in the logic and politics of whiteness and white cultural norms. It is one that is deeply anti-Black in its racial logics or ideologies that have constructed anything different, such as multiculturalism, quote unquote, as a failure, despite multiculturalism not being an official policy of the German government. <clears throat> For me, that statement prompted or got me thinking about the well of knowledge or understanding what it means to be German and to be in this geopolitical space and whence Merkel is drawing this logic from. It is one that links skin color and phenotypical differences that is bound to a particular geography in a positive negative framework. The chancellor's dismissal of multiculturalism from my perspective is very much anti-black while other non-Germans in this sense, not in terms of skin color, can vanish or integrate within the German state or become honorary whites for other groups through the adaption, adaptation, excuse me, of German cultural norms. Afro-Black Germans or people of African descent are forever interloped, inter, interpolated, excuse me, as the alien other, irrespective of how long their genealogy stretches back in time. And additionally, we can understand this concept of what it means to be, to reject multiculturalism as rejecting anything that is different as a wayward Arab 
um, Arabin, sorry, aberrant, can never say that word, <laughs> uncultured, uncivilized, and outside of the liberal humanist concept. Um, so going from this point, I decided to take a little journey to understand where this is coming from. And my research took me across time. However, um, much of my work on anti-Black racism, despite the language not necessarily being used 2000 years ago, um, started to kind of give me an idea that we can see the formation of anything that is different to the European concept um, as going far back as antiquity, also to in the Middle Ages. And that's something that I will reflect on a little bit later. Um, as a symbolic reference for Germany, Angela Merkel's statement reflects the general attitude within Germany, which draws on the historical and geographical construction of Africans and Africans, sorry, African Africans as not human or a human geography or geography inhabited by human one that produces people of African appearance, cultures in a profoundly anti-Black framework while simultaneously reproducing Germany and white Germans as the apogee of human development and civilization. Across this, I looked at education, policing, um, Black soldiers, Afro-Germans, Afro-German children, um, immigration and refugee law, Anti-Semitism, the interconnection between anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and what is now termed as anti-Black racism, and the arts such as jazz, ballet, and classical music. While the breadth and scope might seem to be extensive, it's just to give an overall view of what has been happening in all sphere of German life. Um, what I found was within education, much of the experiences of people of African descent within Germany um, are consistently facing attitudes that, that are drawing on a prior construction of Africans, or in this case, Ethiopians. So I'm going to switch briefly to, um, I don't know if, we, if I have, I can switch to my screen here. Here. So as I was reading. So I hope everyone can see my um, picture here. So here I have a map that was produced in, I believe, 1521. Um, it's one of the earliest maps um, that was supposedly representing Africa, um, which was conflated with Ethiopia. At the time, Africa and Ethiopia were used interchangeably by Europeans. And so going back to education, much of the knowledge that much of the knowledges and the ideas that white German students and educators were drawing on were actually shown to be traceable back to antiquity. So if we look a little bit, look closely to, at the map, excuse me, you can see here where Africans are depicted in a sort of alien-like manner. The closer you go with the further inland you go to um, within Africa, um, the stranger Africans are um, uh, depicted, excuse me. And what a lot of the research on education showed that much of the stereotypes um, uh, about Africans, people of African descent within Germany is specifically coming from a lot of geographical knowledge that was produced and is constantly refined that, pers that persistently places Africans and Africa outside of Germany as some sort of alien other. Here we can see Africans within the heart, quote unquote, of Africa having multiple arms. This one has a, a head into the stomach, excuse me. Um, over here, again, everyone seems a bit more primitive, not with not much culture. To the top, to the, excuse me, the top right hand corner, we have what seems to be an elephant drawn in a very strange way. Um, and this was much, this is part of the rhetoric that still governs a lot of the German education system or what Germans know about Africa 
um, as recently as um, 2018, much of their ideas are drawing on um, Africa and Africans as a strange place without um, any sort of reference to what it means to be human or having culture. Okay, I hope I'm still good for time. Um, going on to policing, um, much of the interactions with policing, unsurprisingly with people of African descent within Germany, also draw on uh, tropes that uh, specifically uh, stigmatize or place Black people, especially when it comes to Black women, in a negative framework, or Germans understand us to be um, the same sort of lens uh, that we would be interpreted by police officers. And the United States and Canada is the same stereotypes that they're drawing from, which again has a historical reference when it comes to um, African people and police. In one particular case, um, uh, African men in um, Berlin and Munich, for example, or in a lot of the police reports that I've been reading so far, I've read, um, they drew stereotypes to, that are directly connected to how um, um, African people are written in these uh, books, in, in their policing, excuse me. Um, moving on to um, black soldiers. Um, again, here we have during the mid 1940s, a lot of the, what was called the black shame or the um, black horror on the Rhine, a lot of the reactions from Germans was the fact that they are now being policed or, or um, protected by savages, uncivilized people, people who are at the lower end of this great chain of being. Much of the rhetoric that circulated around this time, again, drew on this sort of geoclimatic um, theory that, again, placed African Africans outside of history. Um, one thing to note, um, I'm using Africa and Africans or uh, Ethiopians or Black people interchangeably because something that was consistently reoccurring across most of the texts um, was that European scholars didn't really make a big distinction. It was usually the Black African or um, uh, the Black African Negro in some cases or the African Negro. So what we saw was a sort of oscillation. Race wasn't really a big factor per se, but I'm thinking about Geraldine Heng's work in um, uh, Race in the Middle Ages, in which she, you know, she charges us to think about the fact that despite the language race or black not necessarily being consistently used, doesn't mean that the phenomena of erasing or categorizing people through institutional practices didn't exist and not using it actually evacuate the potentiality to see what was going on in the past and actually reproducing those things. And so kind of pivoting back to the black soldiers, a lot of the harm that black soldiers underwent and much of it was very violating and violent, um, drew on stereotypes that are directly traceable to the sort of proto anti-black, proto anti-African racism that started to emerge or started to attach negation to black skin or dark skin and Africa per se. Um, I think I'm good for time. Um, similarly, with the uh, similarly with um, Afro-German children, they face much of the same uh, stereotyping and much of the same anti-black racism. Interestingly, um, this is different in the sense that for Afro children, Afro German children, children born um, from relationships between Afro German soldiers and white German women, um, place Germans in a particular uh, predicament. Predicament, excuse me, because this was the, probably the first time in history that there was a significant amount of Afro German or children born to white German mothers that could not be displaced of the nation. And so anti-Blackness manifested um, much differently in this particular case. For these children, many of them had were um, involuntarily sterilized and forcibly taken from their mothers. A lot of their mothers were denied state services, such as welfare and housing. 
as a result. Um, what the research suggests is that um, by virtue of their relation with Black men, white women were cast aside as Black women or tainted with Black, um, which allows us to think about how Black women, sorry, white German women were a standing figure both for race and nation in which stereotypes of the Black serial rapist or the Black savage or the Black African savage comes to be seen as penetrating and raping the purity of the white nation, which Black German children were a reminder of, and they faced a very different sort of anti-Black racism. Um, in between some of my sections, I have what I'm calling interludes, where it's some of the research I did on proto-racism or proto-anti-Black racism that were um, evident or that scholars had previously done, but not necessarily connected all the time. So here we have a figure from, I forget exactly where this is, but this is showing you how even in the Middle Ages, despite there not being um, Black as a categorical race, um, there was a, a gradual attaching negation um, and anti-humanness to Black or dark-skinned people. This is a picture, um, I believe is Jesus casting the demon out of the African. And much of this is drawing from the Christian theology, theological belief that Black people are um, cursed descendants of Ham. And so what we see across medieval art and literature, canon law, is the gradual depiction of Black people, Africans, as somehow cursed. Um, and our skin color is a sign of this sort of curse, uh, cursedness, um, for instance. I hope I, I'm still in for time. How am I for time? I can't see the screen. Am I still good for time, Vasuki? Okay, good. Okay. Um, right, so going back. So going back now, part of another area in which we see anti-Black racism operating in Germany is immigration and refugee law. So we see that Germany is used, utilizing or attaching anti-Semitism to North, North Africans, North Africans and Arabs as a way to sort of cover over this white racial anxiety and then as a justification to secure their borders even more. So what happens is within the sort of rhetoric that is oscillating, um, and this is specifically in relation to um, 2015 when over a million refugees slash migrants came to Germany, was the immediate um, uh, changing, or not immediate right away, but a gradual changing of laws and a further securitization of the border. And much of this was oscillating or arguing that Arab, North, North African Black people or Arab people were bringing anti-Semitism into Germany, which actually negates the 2000 year history of Germany and most of Europe, um, pushing um, Jews and uh, Muslims out of Europe through programs which were also in Germany, Spain, and France, and England as well. Um, so we see this sort of triangulation in German immigration and refugee law, but also to in rhetoric in which they're utilizing anti-Semitism, attaching anti-Semitism onto North African Black people and Arabs as a way to tighten their borders and to restrict entry of North African people. And a lot of this is also oscillating around um, the idea of deserving versus undeserving refugees and migrants. And much of the sentiment falls, much of the people, the people who are seen as undeserving based on the research has tend to be people who are dark skinned or Africans in general, or people who are black are tending to be seen within Germany and in the, the, the census, um, polling, excuse me, as undeserving as uh, being protected by the state or claiming um, refugee status, excuse me, or being given refugee status. Um, moving on to the art scene, um, we see that in uh, Germans uh, understood jazz to be a sort of quote unquote, Negro music or what they call Neger music. 
Um, and for this was attached to also to anti-Semitism because they blamed uh, Jewish people for importing that. And a part of the reason for this is they, again, drew, drawing on ancient, quote unquote, stereotypes that were produced or started to be produced on Africa from um, Pliny the Elder all the way up through scholars such as um, Schopenhauer, um, Kant and Hegel, et cetera, the German scholars was that black music, quote unquote, um, was incoherent, um, incoherent, had no internal organization, too many drums, too rhythmic, would stir the passion. A lot of it had this sort of um, racial, racist undertones that again is trackable back to the beliefs of Africans as being uncontrollable. And uh, as a result of this sort of evolutionary logic that they constructed, this sort of narrative that they constructed about African Africans. Similarly, we see this sort of anti-Blackness manifest in classical music. So the question is, what is the sound of Blackness or what is the sound of race? And it became much apparent with the first Black or African-American singer to sing at the Bayreuth Festival in the 1960s. The reaction from German scholars um, was that it was not possible. And um, they forced the Black singer to cover up um, with a gold rope and to paint her face. And much of it, much of the rhetoric again revealed that Germans understood particular musical forms as a high, high cultured form of music, ergo cannot be played, um, should not be played by anybody but a white person. Um, and this is the general consensus still today. We see this as recently as last year in the German ballet or the Berlin ballet, where the, the only black ballet singer was told to whiten their face um, because they ruined the line of sight. So implicitly, there is this persistent, implicitly and explicitly, a persistent sort of anti-blackness in which um, pervade Germany across all its um, all all areas, all this institution that again sees Germany, German cultural forms as intrinsically better and the one that we all should adapt, but that is not necessarily going to happen because Germans understand certain things as inherently white and better. Um, on a final note, I'll share this final um, screenshot. Um, this is one of the few positives representation from the Middle East, sorry, not the Middle East, from the Middle Ages of Blackness. Um, but it could be read in multiple ways. He is St. Marcus from the um, Magdeburg Cathedral in Germany. And um, one of the ways we can read this per the research is not necessarily that it is um, pro-Black, but it's a sort of representation of the, um, recuperating Blackness through recuperating the sinner through conversion. So Blackness here can be signified, can be understood based on what I've been reading and based on what I'm thinking through as a sort of white saviorism, um, because this is one of the only positive representation in the sort of Christian arts that we see uh, where Black people or Black person is venerated as a saint um, and so I just kind of wanted to share this um, one, one positive religious imagery um, that can be read multiple ways. And that's it. Thank you so much, Andrew, for that really engaging presentation. Um, I would love to introduce our next speaker. Um, and I'm going to, um, who is uh, Christopher, uh, my research associate in the Race Ethics Power Project. Um, and so I'm going to ask them to come on. While I read their introduction. Um, Christopher, um, Just a minute. Okay. Um, 
Christopher is a research associate at the Center for Ethics at the University of Toronto, as you mentioned before. Um, they received their PhD from the Department of Social Justice Education at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, or OISI for short, in 2020. Uh, their research interests reside in the productive interstices of Black diaspora cultural studies, Black expressive cultures and practices, queer and feminist theory, including post-colonial and decolonial studies. Thank you so much, Fuzuki, for that introduction. Uh, I initially mentioned that I would have a slide. I think I'm going to forgo that because I think, or at least I will perhaps integrate it differently. Uh, so uh, what I'm presenting today is actually a work in progress on uh, my, first, uh, my first monograph uh, that draws upon my research on Black Pride festivals. Uh, and the title is Root Thoughts. Sorry, hold on. <laughs> Root, Root Thoughts, Wandering, uh, in, uh, Intuition, and Itinerancy. Sorry, I'm uh, trying to figure out a way to like keep Zoom visible while at the same time uh, having access to my paper. Just give me a second. Oh, there we go. So I want to begin with an epigraph. With, enthousi with enthusiasm, I set to cataloging and probing my surroundings. France Fanon, The Fact of Blackness, Black Skin, White Masks, 1967, English edition. Every time I return to this place I call home, you'll engage me in the same conversation as I become accustomed. So as I become accustomed to re-entry, I will answer your questions held, held, uh, head held high while trying not to giggle when you ask me if I bring in firearms and livestock into the country. The only question of in interest is when you ask, what was your purpose of what was your purpose of travel? And I will say business and pleasure. The combination will prompt you to ask the question again, but this time to seek, I don't know what, to trip me up? Darling with unflattering crew cut, my business is pleasure and vice versa. And both are none of your damn business. What do you do at U of T? They will ask. I am, or I was then, a PhD candidate, but I also teach. What do you teach? Well, my degree is in education, but I work in women and gender studies. What do you do at U of T? And I pause, you're asking me this again? How much did they take off the size of your head, Mr. Crewcut? I repeat, I'm studying education, specifically matters of equity. I can't control my eye roll and I hold my tongue till I hear him bang the stamp on my passport. Every return when I am hailed into the scene, it is a repetition and I am prompted to wonder, why is my mobility a surprise? I, like many diaspora folks, have a similar script memorized to make sure that we can re-enter. The fact that I have the means to travel for work with pleasure in mind is seen as somehow circumspect. Each time I wonder, how an officer such as yourself can't imagine that I move because I understand non-belonging as a radical affect and instinct. And its practice is a source of creating community otherwise off a legible grid. If I'm not imagined to have an emplacement upon my return, 
and my, uh, and my arrival fails to resonate in your imagination, just remember, I move and I opt for wandering. Inclusion is far off my radar, radar, nor is it an aspiration. Liberation resides here in fleeting moments and I will welcome the nourishment provided. But to be clear, there are no easy maps to denote black queer life worlds, but let's engage a brief snapshot. In 2016, Pride Toronto would designate Black Lives Matter, to, uh, the Toronto chapter, as the honored activist group to lead the parade. At the intersection of college and young, members of BLM Toronto and their supporters would hold up the parade for 30 minutes, perhaps more, but what does it matter? To express a list of nine demands to the board of Pride Toronto. This certainly caused a quote unquote scandal as that particular year, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was in attendance. The most prominent and consistent demand would be number eight, which was the removal of police floats and booths in all pride marches, parades, and community spaces. Across geographies, this would be a common theme expressed among participants in the research that I've conducted, not just on Black Pride festivals, but on the phenomenon of pride festivals in general. And the vexing contention was that the relationship, the, the, the biggest contention was the relationship between police forces, both at the local and state level, and their impact on Black, queer, and trans lives. Deferring to the role of activism within pride festivals, specifically uh, pride, uh, pride what we now call Pride Toronto. When we defer to uh, when we defer to that action, it illustrates contested and inter uh, intercommunal debates within Black, queer, and trans communities, not necessarily cohering with each other. Reminis reminiscent of Pride Toronto in its early years, circa 1980s, BLM Toronto in 2006, uh, 2016 would infuse a rigorous political agenda into the festivities that was met with backlash. Of key concern was that such acts, actions were understood by primarily white gay male pride revelers as somehow an insult, thus rendering pride Toronto festivities, quote unquote, inhospi inhospitable to tourists and dignitaries. This taxonomy drawn here in hospitable is an intriguing one that is worth of, like worthy of ex exploration. If the insurrection of BLM Toronto in 2016 engendered a scene of inhospitality, what were the parameters and assumed guidelines for queer folk to be and be seen as hospitable and to whom? Our notions of hospitality deeply entwined and buttressed with contemporary homonormative desires for respectability, echoing uh, early insights by Lisa Dugan. But lastly, how is the performance of Pride festivals main th maintained through measures of surveillance in order, in order to offer a respectable re-presentation to echo Hazel Carby of LGBT plus communities. I address these questions through a few brief ruminations. Root thought number one, wandering, intuition, itinerancy. Itinerancy denotes various forms of movement and mobility and acquires manifold meanings through its synonyms such as wandering, roaming, and so on. We may add to this list uh, with graciousness, uh, with uh, sorry, sorry, with graciousness to Saidia Hartman, uh, the notion of being wayward. I opt for a notion of itinerancy to assem assemble a language to illuminate how Black queer diasporic performances disrupt and or augment uh, 
Pride festivities to offer alternate routes for Black LGBT plus communion. Thus itinerancy, or what I'm inclined to call an itinerant hospitality, enables the grammar to grapple with the surprise of Black LGBT plus presence from a so-called elsewhere that falls outside of tourism imaginaries. At present, the numbers of participants at Blockarama increase annually, uh, prompting imaginative consideration of expanding to a two-day two event. We could refer to Blockarama as somehow tangential to a Black pride, but as I've been told, while it is an expression of Black pride, it is not a Black pride festival proper in that it's not affiliated with uh, what is now the Center for Black Equity, which is the umbrella organization for a global movement of Black Pride festivals now reaching 35 plus. In 2019, the lineup to enter Blockorama extended down Wellesley and wrapped around Church Street, enveloping the geography of Pride with Black LGBT, LGBT plus bodies claiming space. I'm less, I'm less inclined to know if actual statistics capture the number of local, quote unquote, local Black LGBT plus participants, but rather instead the ebb and flow of bodies from elsewhere wandering to find kin. If one had to wander, what were the sensory and spatial clues that led them to the space that Blockorama facilitates? Was an itinerary conceived in advance, but later augmented upon succumbing to the sonic and visceral call of the base. Itineraries are themselves tools to map out one's sojourn into unfamiliar, yet perhaps violent territory. Was there a different map felt by intuition and instantiated by the, the stories of other Black LGBT plus travelers for example, did the, did the travels of Toronto's DJ Black Cat, AKA Michael Hall, to Houston Splash, an affiliated Black Pride Festival, an extended extend an invitation or leave behind a rumor of a different Black, uh, Black queer geography that augments dominant spatial configurations? How then are these travelers addressed differently? through a circuit of cultural exchange that is in excess of dominant tourism marketing schemes. The count is high, 25,000 plus locals traveling and wandering, coming to this space. The Black LGBT, uh, Black LGBT plus presence is incalculable, incalculable or easily, or easily categorized, because in a dominant queer imaginary, a dominant geographical geo, a, ge, a dominant geographical imaginary, black queerness enters the fold as a surprise, arriving from this purported elsewhere, and yet, the point of departure could be Brampton, Durham, but it could also be Buffalo or Detroit. Here, the matter of who is addressed and by whom is of key concern. As noted in the Pride Toronto Economic Impact Report of, uh, published in 2019, 30% of attendees came from outside of the greater Toronto area and 5% from outside of Canada. These statistics are ambiguous as best because they rely upon official data from the tourism industry that account for uh, such factors as the number of hotel rentals, the number of airline tickets purchased and so on. However, there are many circuits of movement or wandering that eludes this calculation, billeting, couch, couch surfing, hosting by a chosen family, to be clear, this is not a call for aggregated or race-based uh, race data. Of interest is how absented presences become visible within a larger narrative of Pride Toronto, 
intended to signal the multi -char multicultural character of the organization and perhaps of Canada par excellence. If marketing schemes by Pride Toronto to bolster its commitment to the diversity have failed and have not been fully realized, a different form of address by and to Black LGBT persons accounts for the success of events such as Block Rama. Root thought number two, itinerant hospitality. I see you in St. James Town, and I will ask you, where are you from? Only because I am washed over in your southern drawl when you ask, where do Black folks go in this city? You and your crew are all dressed in white. Girl, I'm reading you. You go into Polly Perry's boat cruise. I see you. My friends will chime in too, offering ideas of spaces on or off the grid of a legible queer community. I hold this question of what is in hospitable to heart due to a felt intuition to echo Philip Brian Harper that this question arises within a history of discrimination, anti-Black uh, anti -black racism being at the forefront within queer community that precedes the asking. An itinerant hospitality in the scene or moment is both a recognition of differential maps and clues for dwelling as well as cautionary instruction that myth myths of hospitality cause harm. Thus, an itinerant hospitality requires one to demystify the map of hospitality that is promulgated in tourism marketing schemes that draw the borders of the village almost as if it's a, uh, almost as if it's a betrayal to enact different and more livable queer geographies. You may, in fact, feel, greater, feel a greater sense of belonging, quote unquote, over there on the outskirts, or you may not. There are no guarantees. It is nonetheless born out of an ethic of care. In our movements, we are drawn to look for each other, yearning for these spatial clues where we solicit each other's gaze. We enact a different way of being in the world. I, like you, my, my, may find myself elsewhere. It could be in Palmer Park in Detroit during hotter than July. And I ask you, where are the gay clubs in the city? You without flinching will explain, we don't go to the white clubs, you don't wanna go there. I and my friends will be grateful, not just for the intel, Though valuable, but for the recognition. In my eyes, you would see a kind of wonder, different from the look of someone lost. I, we are wondering, wandering, and yet feel welcome in our transience. Indeed, this is an ethical encounter, a relation that culminates in different, in a different livable itinerary. These maps that we draw together are not de are derived out of mere courtesy, being hospitable. You and I are not a surprise to each other upon arrival. This moment was anticipated, desired, and perhaps welcomed. In the space of mutual recognition, we are holding each other to a promise that our lives matter to each other and that we are ethically bound to ensure each other's survival. Anytime, any place. To pose an, an, an itinerant hospitality as a praxis enables an embodied critique of the dominant spatial configurations that render queer, queer communities as safe or hospitable and yet are experienced as hostile, uh, ge uh, hostile geographies for black, uh, black queer people as a praxis and to as a commitment to continually redraw the lands landscape of black queer life in all of its elsewhere. After pride, there is the vexing lingering sense of disappointment that, con that that conviviality that was so well promised 
we imagined were shared across difference would be short-lived and inequitable. And yet, but, and then subsequently violent social and geographic arrangements would be recalibrated the morning after. In Toronto, the rainbow, the rainbow flags that will adorn the windows of banking institutions and other corporate sponsors alike will later be scrubbed off. Their commitment seemingly fulfilled. Police forces will resume surveillance of black queer persons, particularly youth in a disproportionate manner, but the party continues. For some, certainly not for all. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Um, I also wanna say thank you for this thought-provoking panel of presentations under ethical geography and itineracy. Um, I really appreciated the diverse sets of discussions that Chelsea, Andrew, and Christopher Broach, which all focused on this central question of whose ethics are we talking about anyways? And in what ways does grounding our such research in geography refine our scholarly analysis? Um, and so I'm wondering if you could come back on the screen because um, we have a few questions. Um, And feel free to jump in with um, questions that you may have for the other presenters on your panel too. Um, but these are some of the questions that came up uh, from the audience uh, and as well as myself. And so I would like to start with the first one uh, addressed to Chelsea. What are some of the resistances encountered in Asia when it comes to incorporating Indigenous approaches? Or what does a global understanding of Indigenous methodologies look like in practice? Is it changes at the policy level or um, cultural changes or something else altogether? Okay, yeah, uh, great, great questions. Um, so maybe just addressing the first question, um, I would say that there is quite a lack of recognition of um, Indigenous identity in Asia, and that makes it really hard to incorporate Indigenous approaches because obviously categorizing them and, and sort of um, and sort of applying a certain uh, title is actually quite significant in approaching Indigenous research because uh, the field is still evolving. It's a very sort of, it's not new, but it's still undefined and it's sort of, uh, you know, undiscovered territory, especially when it comes to a global context uh, and beyond a Western context. So it does get quite important um, understanding and navigating the politics within Asian countries and how they want to uh, sort of label or recognize um, their, you know, like the indigenous peoples there. A lot of times they're, they're called ethnic minorities. A lot of times, um, you know, they're sort of reduced to a certain, um, like, yeah, a certain ethnicity within the country itself. Um, and that sort of sometimes could diminish their significance in the global context when it comes to indigenous, um, you know, affirmations and understanding how to ethically approach research in their communities. Because a lot of times these share similar struggles to indigenous peoples in Western contexts as well. So um, I think that's one of the main resistances is acknowledging this title in Asia. Um, and the second question, what does the global understanding? Um, yeah, so I, I would say um, I don't have like a definitive sort of uh, concept in mind um, just because it does vary you know, within contexts, within different countries, within different communities. But I, I see a lot of the similar um, struggles that are being faced um, in terms of, you know, corruption, in terms of governmental oppression, in terms of, you know, systemic policies that seek to sort of um, control and um, restrict mobility for Indigenous peoples um, that you know, are seen all around the world and not just within Western contexts. So I think sort of looking at a lot of the Western pretty well-established guidelines would be a good starting point to seeing how we can approach it in the global context. And um, I would say having 
a better understanding, first of all, recognizing indigenous titles in uh, the global context, like in Asia, would be the first step. Then second step would probably be um, seeing how their their like research has been historically and how their current ideologies and, and current values and traditions could be incorporated in research and, and developing it sort of like the Maui cultural, uh, the Maui people of New Zealand sort of developed their own research methodologies based on their own personal values and indigenous uh, traditions um, through, you know, practice and, and through probably like revision and, and all of these, uh, you know, experiences that they've built up over the years, um, that would definitely be necessary too. I think really trying to extensively understand their context, extensively understand how it can really shape to become research material. Um, and the last question, is it at a policy level or culturally motivated? Um, I would say, I think, I would say it's a mix. I would say that research in indigenous communities should be really flexible. And I think that it should start by being culturally motivated and it should start with the sociocultural practices. And then it can move beyond that and towards policy and towards um, enacting change in you know, governance and in governance structures and self-determination. Wonderful, thank you. Um... I'm going to ask a question um, that came up during Andrew's presentation. Um, in what ways do you see counter narratives by Afro-Germans intervening? Is self-representation um, through art or in art changing the cultural landscape of race or intervening in a rather tiring narrative as you so wonderfully um, illustrated? Uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry I did just started talking. <laughs> um, I will say Afro-Germans, um, first, first and foremost, um, I just want to just put this out there is that this is actually a, a literature review. It's not like something from the ground up. Um, most of the sources that I am drawing from are from Afro-Germans, actually, Afro-German academics. So they are, um, you know, speaking from, I'm drawing or presenting much of their views, clearly not all, because I didn't touch on Afro-Germans who are queer or differently abled. I didn't speak about gender issues, right? Um, there are many different groups, you know, it's not a monolith, uh, differences of age, et cetera. So a lot of the accounts of racism being an outsider, I'm drawing from their accounts, their lived experience, their children, their parents, et cetera. And having been, having living, excuse me, having, I've been speaking German all day, so my English is kind of twisted around. <laughs> so having, Jesus, I have been living in Germany for 15 years. So having a few friends who are Afro-Germans also gave me a little bit of insight, but of course, no group is a monolith. So the work that I've presented so far is really being drawn from, I would say 95% of the literature is actually from scholars who work on Germany, who are Afro-German um, or have forwarded me sources um, on Black Germany, for example, or Black Europe uh, in general. So um, they are doing that work. And, you know, it's not always, you know, negative, so to speak, or, you know, um, and, uh, but it's something that you kind of have to do both things at the same time, represent the histories, their histories, um, but specifically the histories of racism against people of color or specifically black people in Germany. Um, uh, especially the literature on black children that actually was forwarded to me by a uh, actually wasn't even published and I asked her she is a black professor here black German professor and she generously shared it with me I will not reveal the name because she asked me not to because it's not yet published um, but yeah Afro Germans are intervening they have been intervening but unfortunately just as institutional racism plagued the academy in Canada so does it to hear oftentimes um, Afro-Germans, Black Germans, Africans, African Jamaicans such as myself in the academy in Europe, you also don't get the institutional support to do research. It's only um, last year as a result of Each One Teaches, a local community organization that the German government, government finally decided to recognize Black people and do an official census 
but they're the ones that actually had to design the survey and carry it out, right? Um, there's plenty of reasons for that, it has to do with Nazism and they don't want to reify, excuse me, they don't want to reify race, but race is something that while we can acknowledge that, you know, it is not necessarily 100% biological, it definitely is sociologic, socially produced and it, racism is real. And Germans use that, many Germans and institutions use that as a reason not to research race and if you don't research race and no racism exists, that's kind of the logic that's operationalized in Germany. So um, to that question, Afro-Germans are and have and continue speak for themselves. I don't speak for Afro-Germans, I'm not Afro-German. I'm just um, looking at those experiences as an outsider um, and what it means. And this is part of my larger project for my PhD proposal, actually. So that was what I was tasked with. Um, in terms of self-representation through art, um, I can't speak too much on that topic. Um, the research I did on art really had to do with the depiction of blackness in the Middle Ages and looking at how, again, these, the, these tired or racist anti-black narratives, you know, started to emerge because um, no idea occur in a vacuum. So my question with multiculturalism really is wondering where are these ideas coming from, right? So where, which well is Angela Merkel drawing on that presumes that Germany is always and ever been a sort of homogeneous monocultural space? Germans are not a monolith. Right, Germany as we know it is fairly new in world history. It's like 160 something years. Um, and from the top to the bottom of Germany, there are multiple German cultures. Um, so I can't really speak to that because I don't have the um, background. My bringing into art was that visual art is a medium that was used in the middle ages to transmit ideas much faster because the vast majority of, popul of the population in the Middle Ages were quote unquote illiterate. And this sort of also repeats itself during the um, 19th and 20th century with the moving pictures, which is a word I can't seem to forget now. Um, and the proliferation of anti-black stereotypes that happened in the early 19th and 20th century with the invention of the movie projector, the dissemination of images that were drawing on a priori constructions of Black Africans as the devils, as devil worshiping, as heathens, as um, Satanists, all these sort of taxonomy, um, taxo taxonomous um, negative ideas about African Africans, which drew on stereotypes that were being produced, even if they were unevenly produced. Um, during the art came into it because nobody was reading at that time. But lots of the ideas about differences, whether it was Muslims or Africans or Jews, was depicted through art. And this was rapidly spread around. I can't really speak to that. Um, to that. Um, but African, Afro-Germans, people of African descent, Black people in Germany are intervening in this very exhausted and tiring narrative. Nonetheless, um, it's part of our everyday existence here and it keeps changing and morphing. I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Christopher a question. Um, could you say more about this ethical encounter that you mentioned and the connection to this notion of hospitality? Is it reciprocal or does it require generosity for, to foreground the encounter? Um, I, was, I, I, was, I, I was, I was, I was, I was looking at the question uh, to kind of figure out how would I respond and my, the easiest way to do so is to share yet another kind of anecdote and so in one of my sojourns when I was in Detroit for a music festival, a Black Queer Music Festival that a friend of mine was putting together. Uh, one afternoon, we were looking for a soul food restaurant. And 
I feel almost silly actually saying we're in a primarily black neighborhood because it's Detroit. Detroit is a prim primarily black city. And so when I say that we encountered an, uh, uh, an elderly woman and we asked like, uh, where's the best place to go get self, like soul food? And she read us. And when I mean like read, like she's kind of like, okay, yeah, I know you a duck and I know you two are queer. And she's like, yeah, the best soul rest, like soul food restaurant is in my, like in my hood, but you don't want to go to my hood. And so this question around, and so again, this is where this question around intuition comes in because I remark at this encounter and I think of it as ethical because there's always this backdrop of something that we call black homophobia that apparently has this toxicity that makes my life unlivable. But yet here we are in this moment where the woman's just kind of like, yeah, I'm going to be generous and say like, yeah, these are a couple of places you might want to check out. These are some places where you may feel unsafe. And so in answer to the second part of the question, there is a generosity to the encounter because, ultim because ultimately it's about ensuring life. And so, uh, I, mean, that, I mean, that would be the way that I would, uh, that would be the way that I would uh, continue to elaborate on why I refer to these moments as ethical encounters because we could easily just dismiss each other but we choose not to. And it's the very fact that we choose not to that be, like immediately inaugurates it as an ethical scene where it's just like, yeah, I don't wanna see you, to, I don't wanna see you get hurt. So don't go this way or don't go that way. And we don't see that within, or at least I'm, I'm gen, genuinely hard pressed to see that kind of praxis happen within queer community. And I've been involved in queer community and activism for 25 plus years. But that level when you're just merely another person in the world, but in a unfamiliar geography and someone offers that generosity, it's like, I want to think through that and what that means on a deeper level, because it's counter to the narrative that we hear about black geographies especially when queer uh, when queer bodies enter those spaces. And so yeah, that would be a short answer or a shortish answer. Thank you so much. Um, does anybody here have any questions to the other panelists? I know that I oftentimes uh, get the privilege of being able to um, gather the questions from the YouTube channel and other channels that we have for people to ask questions, but I'm wondering and wanted to give you this opportunity. If you had any questions for the other panelists, feel free to ask them. I really like both Christopher's and Chelsea's um, presentation, but I was too busy and gross thinking about what they were saying and um, to think of any question that would be, you know, I don't know, good enough, <laughs> but I really, really, really like both, especially. Ask it, ask it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 Andrew, I feel the same way as well because you, co uh, you covered a lot in the time that, you covered a lot in the time that you were given. And again, one of, uh, I guess where I see this kind of, I guess, uh, connection between uh, between all three of our presentations is that we're thinking through ways of imagining these ge like geographic spaces mm -hmm. or geopolitical spaces differently or right. otherwise. Uh, Chelsea, in the case of like reimagining, well, what does it mean to extend indigeneity beyond how well? For those of us who either are uh, citizens of Canada or settlers, depending mm -hmm. on which term you decide to use that day, uh, where we understand indigeneity primarily within this North American lens, but then what would it mean to actually understand that there are Indigenous peoples mm 
that are also engaging in struggles. And so this question becomes not just around space, it's, a, it's something more. And so I, I saw those connections between all three of our papers in terms of thinking, what does it mean to make these demands while at the same time not necessarily want to have these demands being filtered or controlled by the state. Mm -hmm. like, and, uh, so Andrew, when you were talking about the ways in which finally there's going to be census data produced about Afro-Germans and yet they're going to design the study. Right. It, it, I'm, it, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that and also Chelsea, how you might jump in because these are very critical questions in terms of well, if the research is part of a process of redress. Uh, yeah, it's what, it's. what are the ethical concerns in terms of who is doing the process? Yeah, it's it's something you know that I took part of it as a resident. I got the invitation to do it as well because I self-identify as Black in Germany. So I had this, the, um, the invitation to do it, but to me, it's part of this, you know, the fact that it's in 2020 and it only picked up speed as a result of Black Lives Matter with George Floyd last year. There was this, all of a sudden, I guess, they felt ashamed while, you know, we have Angela Merkel speaking on, because normally in Germany, they constantly look to North America as the, the cesspool of anti-Black racism. And it just became to the, it came too hypocritical for them to constantly point there while Black Germans were saying, hey, we need to stop looking to Canada, the US and the United Kingdom. This is happening to us here. And Germany, the German government never recognized that at all. Um, and I think, it, for me at least, it is not necessarily ethical to put the onus on and um, the black community here to collect this sort of data. But that is that has that is what they have had to do in as in almost every scenario when it comes to policing, education, community activists and researchers have been the one in Germany to go and collect the data because Germany refuses to collect the data. Um, using um, multiple reason, multiple reasonings that make no sense. You know, a lot of it is like we have strong privacy laws. Meanwhile, as uh, everyone who lives in Germany actually has to register, register with the city hall, you have to give them your date of birth, uh, where you live, all this information, but it's too much to collect you know, race-based data or data of ethnic origin. And it's something that I was thinking about in terms of your question that, you know, ethically, I don't think it should fall onto the shoulders of activists and community members, um, because even looking at the design of the survey, not to sound elitist, but it actually, there is a lot of problems with the survey itself. And you could tell that um, it needed some, um, maybe more institutional support, which it wasn't really getting as far as I'm concerned, especially when they had to translate it. When it was translated from German to English and to other languages, um, it wasn't really clear a lot of the questions. And so that institutional support still wasn't there, even though um, Germans were, Afro-Germans were do doing this work. And so to me, it's kind of like, okay, here you go, I'm, you know, you guys are complaining all the time. Here is some money, do it yourself without the, the institutional back and the full support of the state. Um, and I don't think it has been successful with these data because that's what I've heard so far, just because of the, how it was um, deployed. And I feel that's ethically speaking, um, they should have done it. It should have had significantly more institutional support. Many of my friends who are black in Germany didn't even know about the survey, right? Um, so those are just my, uh, two cents on it. Yeah, um, I found that really interesting to consider, Andrew, and your presentation in general. But just now when you mentioned, you know, that it shouldn't fall on the hand, it shouldn't be res uh, the responsibility of the, you know, Afro-Germans to really conduct this re report or conduct this research and co collect the data, and instead should really be 
an institutional thing and institutional responsibility. It kind of makes me think of this uh, and the contrast this has with maybe looking into some of the indigenous research that I've done and um, seeing how a lot of times, especially when it comes to ecological knowledge, a lot of this research is, you know, first of all, um, proposed and devised um, and implemented by outsiders. You know, a lot of times outsiders are the ones making the demands to come inside their communities that indigenous peoples live in, instead of the indigenous peoples asking for the research to be done in their community, you know? So it's sort of the other way around in, in terms of the difference between our projects. Um, but I, I think there's also really interesting um, problems that come with that because there is inherent mistrust with a yeah. lot of researchers that are coming in to do research in these communities because they're already really vulnerable. They're already, you know, suffering from a lot of systemic oppression, a lot of, you know, um, outsider, uh, colonial, you know, with North America, a lot of colonial um, research has been really damaging to them historically. And um, in Asian contexts, like I know with my grandmother's community, she's had research done on, um, you know, the rice cultivation and the forms of uh, rice fields that they implement, which is actually quite innovative. Um, and so I think it's 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 there's a lot of a mistrust. So I think it's really important to consider ethical research, not just because it would prevent the sort of harmful exploitation of the communities, but it would also rebuild the trust and it would rebuild this sort of idea that we're working at this problem together, you know, because a lot of these ecological issues are really beneficial, not just for the research itself, but for humankind, you know, for for understanding more about climate change, understanding more about like sustainable practices. So not only should it be beneficial in that way, but it also should be a collaborative process that rebuilds the trust between the researchers who are outsiders oftentimes and the people who are from these communities who, you know, see them as as strangers coming in, having no idea what their intentions are, what their objectives are, what they're publishing. So yeah, I think there's a interesting linkage between our projects. But yeah, I, I enjoyed both you, yours and, and Christopher's, and I enjoyed listening to them. No, I I definitely um, a lot of things that you said, especially I have the book that you give the uh, Linda Toa Smith. I hope I'm saying her correct. Um, um, I definitely can see, you know, the connections. And I definitely think that um, in terms of why, because um, I am not a party to the process, I could see why perhaps um, it was left to community members. And um, I think that's definitely a good thing. I, I think more specifically, it could have used perhaps maybe a more cooperative approach or giving more, um, not a takeover, but I think the awareness, the structure definitely could have used a little bit more support. Um, and that support could of course, should be agreed to by community members who were designing the process. So I guess that's kind of where I'm, what I'm thinking about. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and I guess one that would be, um, respectful of the history or mindful of the histories of research on our respective communities, but also to providing the resource that we often lack in our own communities because of these histories to do that in a way that would be um, uh, beneficial for our, our um, communities in an ethical way and could also frame it within Christopher's um, concept of uh, ethical encounter. Like what would that look like if you brought these two together um, because of the lack of resources due to these histories, right? Um, and that resource could also mean like design, bringing in people who are Afro-German, who have those sort of sets of skills, who are recognized, recognize the histories as well and how to do that. So I feel like those are some of the things that could have been um, teased out a little bit more. I don't want to use the word refined at all or progress or anything. Does that make sense? For sure, yeah, those are definitely great like comments on that. Um, yeah, there's definitely things I can say more about the book, but I don't know how much time we have um, in terms of questions, Suzuki. Feel free to um, answer. I know we had um, set aside some time for this, so if you want to give a more answer to this, feel free to. 
um, and then we will take a break and come back for the second time. Yeah, I really, um, I really, um, I would like to hear more. Maybe Chris, if you can share his introduction with us later, perhaps for email to look at ethical encounter. I'm thinking because you know I'm thinking about like even the question like even is it ethical for me as an outsider to do research, you know, um, even though I'm I'm part of the Black African diaspora, what does that look like? You know, I'm still an outsider, and I ran into I met somebody today, just he's actually Afro Afro German, and we were having this conversation, and he started introducing me to people on Instagram who are Afro Germans here. So I was telling him about my research plans and. This is again, you know, kind of running with this this framework. You know, I'm um, I'm often wondering to myself, is it the right thing to do? Is it my job? I don't have that experience, right? I don't have that lived experience, but I'm also not looking at it just from Afro German perspective. I'm actually thinking about the different groups of Black people, including myself in Germany because at the end of the day, we seem to be collapsed under this one thing as Black people in Germany. Does that make sense? Oh, you're, you're muted, Christopher. <laughs> Very much so. No, 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 it makes perfect sense. And I think, So again, so again, I'm probably going to end up deferring to an anecdote because, I mean, ultimately, and so like, if I had to share my own kind of research journey, um, and there actually is going to be a section in uh, my manuscript about process, but also my experience in the archive, because I was able to do this work in part because I've cultivated relationships with people as part of my travels. Mm -hmm. And so, so for example, when I was looking to uh, have an interview with uh, Lady Philippoku, uh, who's the ED of UK Black Pride, the person who's in charge of social media, Haley Reed, is a friend of my friend, Sarah. And so I go through Sarah, Sarah puts me in touch with Haley. Haley, once I arrived in London, texts Lady Phil and says, Lady Phil, you need to meet with him. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden I'm in Clapham Junction. Mm -hmm. I don't recommend going to Clapham Junction. I feel like I could like be found dead there. It's like all like, but either way, but this is where her workplace was because she's also, she works for labor. Mm -hmm. and so, but, and so I, under, I understand the process, uh, the process already that if you don't know me from Adam, I need to find a way to build trust mm -hmm. in some way, shape or form. And so, I mean, in my particular circumstance, like I would start with who do I know that can vouch for me? Right, right. Um, and so in, in many cases, like, you know, other, like, you know, other black queer colleagues would say, don't worry about it. Tell them I sent you. And tell them I sent you means something. Like it's like, like we like we chuckle because it's just because it's almost like, because it's very because it's also very familial. It's a very familial thing. Like yeah. it's like your mother telling, like it's like your mother telling, you know, telling you when you go when you go when you go see Mrs. So and so, tell she I sent you. Right, right. It's a sort of like, like, yeah. So already there's like a certain kind of proto like why why i'm using proto now because you used proto earlier but but it's a kind of it's a proto it's a proto kinship or an imagine an imagined kinship where it's like yes i will vouch for this person and mm -hmm. um, i mean but that's only one of many other many other ways but it's never not nerve-wracking when you just think to yourself like what if i get there and then like you know, I say something stupid. <laughs> right, right. No, it's... Instead, my experience has been the reverse, where, and so again, it comes back to the earlier question around reciprocity, mm -hmm. where it's like, if you have a genuine concern about what you're researching, 
and that it matters to you deeply in your heart, then you come with that reciprocity reciprocity from the very get-go. Right, right. I mean, I, I definitely appreciate that. And I Chelsea's work, especially on, I was, I was thinking about what Chelsea was talking about decolonizing and even, even the fact that I don't want to reproduce any sort of colonizing ways of producing knowledge. And so taking like that sort of ethics, but also to those methods, how can I produce that? Um, or in a collaborative manner, because also to, I'm thinking through like not producing it from just my position, but also to more of like a probably community-based ethnography, you know, where it's multiple perspectives um, and not just mine. And so those are just some of the things that Chelsea's work was kind of provoking in how I'm gonna approach this project um, because across all the literature, these are different positions of Afro-Germans and black people who have been here and their experiences are not always the same, but this geographical space that is known as Germany is a one that is deeply, a deeply anti-black geography just on the account of dismissing differences and one of the biggest, one of the, one of the things that basically structures difference in our world is skin color. Um, and so I'm kind of, that's kind of what I'm, I'm thinking about as well. Like, how do I do that? Yeah. And, and it was definitely, you know, um, and because of this, I met this uh, Afro-German guy. I just was looking at these cute pants in the store. I went in and he was also queer. And it's like, come with me in, you know, there's an Afro-German festival that I, book festival that I didn't even know about that I'm going to. And it's like, I'll introduce you to people. So I think um, some of those fairs, you know, even going back to the question, you know, how, you know, including Afro-German narratives and not speaking for them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, just something that I thought of when uh, I heard Christopher and, um, my, and Andrew, you talk was, um, I don't know, something that sort of I found in common with both of your research and something you guys are both talking about is that idea of, you know, this fine line between being an outsider and sort of also trying to integrate yourself enough that you build this trust, right? And to sort of establish commonality so you can, you can relate to them more and you can really build this foundation to have good research. Um, and I was just thinking about, you know, the ways that, uh, would you think, coming from a different perspective, if you, you know, because of race and maybe your background, like, do you think coming from a potentially, like if you were a white man who, you know, a white male who had really like no understanding of this from an individual personal perspective, like, do you think it would be much harder for your researcher or what positions would differ? Like, would your position on this research differ? You know, if you were coming in as someone who could not relate to anything that you were researching or, or most of what you were researching, not as much as you could relate now. I just curious. Well, my stance is I would not research a community that I was not a part of, even though I'm experiencing this sort of insider outsider. It's it's, some, it's something that I just said, you know, I'm never going to do. Um, I don't want to assume, because for me, if you have to learn the language of a group of people that tells me that you're not a part of that group, right? Even tangentially, like I could see Christopher across the street. We don't know Christopher from Adam, but we're the only two black people and we nod our heads at each other. You know, most people who are not black don't do that, especially when it comes to black men or people who are non-binary or black people they are not doing that. Black people in general do that to each other. I might go to um, London and I see, I'm in the widest part of London or some village and I see Christopher Crosby. We don't know each other from Adam and we nod our head because it's sort of this sort of, I don't know, trans historical knowing. I don't know what term would we give this? We kind of just know what's the what. We're the only two here and we know what that means, right? And so, um, that has been my stance from day one, but increasingly slow because of the, I wouldn't do, for example, I wouldn't do research on people who are non-binary or trans. I definitely wouldn't do research on, at least not by myself, right? Because this is then taken um, up space, but also to 
I don't have that experience. I wouldn't even go to Jamaica because I have not lived in Jamaica for most of my life, even though I am a Jamaican citizen. I wouldn't go to Jamaica now because Jamaicans would see me as a foreigner. Perhaps in some limited context, I'd have to figure it out, but that's kind of my general stance. I wouldn't do it in any communities that I'm not really a part of. Does that make sense? Also to the knowledge that I would get, the knowledge that Christopher would get, you would get, or Basuki, um, is going to be very different based on how we're being read and if we're part of the community. A white person going to a black community is not going to get the same information that Christopher and I could get. And that also changes when it comes to sexuality and age, right? And also to the time of day, for example, which we don't think about the mood the person is in. What the knowledge that we're going to glean is not just about trust, but how we're also read because we are produced from particular images, thinking, going back to what um, Christopher read from Franz Fanon, we have been produced in a sort of uh, stereotypical way of the idea of blackness or Asianness has been constructed. And, you know, this means that certain people would get certain knowledge. And this is something that I constantly hold in mind after reading Donna Haraway's work from years ago. I forgot the name of the paper, Christopher, Pazuki, Chelsea. Do you know the paper I'm talking about? Situated Knowledges. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, so I read Situated Knowledges and I read this reader called um, Discovering Reality, feminist, feminist, feminist on epistemology and ways of knowing the world. And after reading those, I decided I personally just, that's not my investment. I would have, I would have a different answer and I hope this answers your question, Chelsea. No, because, so you, so you sparked two different, you sparked two different responses, so I'm going to try and make them as quick as possible because I know that we're also getting close to uh, taking a break before we move to session number two. So my first response, and so this question around insider, outsider, and I think this is why uh, intellectually, philosophically, theoretically, that I'm moving towards thinking through a notion of a Black queer diaspora analytics, precisely because I have no problem doing research in Trinidad if I go there knowing that I'm owning my, owning my position right from the very get-go, mm -hmm. coming from foreign. If I go there and I'm saying I'm coming from foreign and I'm not performing insidership, mm -hmm. but rather being quite literal and saying, what kinds of ways can we have a different kind of conversation that breaks us from that dichotomy? Again, mm -hmm. that's reciprocal, that's ethical, mm -hmm. depending on what that project might be. I have no idea what that project might be, but I'm just saying hypothetically, if I ever wanted to do it like research in Trinidad, I would go there already, on, which is pretty much how, how I would, uh, well, that's pretty much how I approached my work when I was doing work in the States. Like, I mm -hmm. know already after years of traveling that like we have different person, we have different life, uh, uh, we have different kinds of ways of being in the world mm -hmm. uh, that don't necessarily separate us, but they're very, very noticeable. And so like, when I have friends from Detroit that come and we take them to a dance club and they'll be like, wow, you all in Canada do something else with your waist. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about whining. And it's just like, it's these nuances, it's these nuances where it's just like, yes, we don't have to be the same. We just need to simply be welcoming of the fact that like, oh my God, there are all of these vast experiences. What is the, co like, what is the common ground if we're here to talk about a common purpose? Uh, but then the other, uh, my other response would have also been, and I think this extends what I'm saying, my first experience as a research assistant was for a project examining uh, LGBT voluntary organizations. This was like, I'm gonna be dating myself like roughly about 20 years ago. Uh, and I intentionally, because the lead researcher was white, my colleague who was the other research assistant was white. And I'm just like, yeah, I'm not allowing you to like interview people of color. Like, 
first, you're not going to get the interview. Uh, but that's also presumptuous of me to begin with, because who knows, maybe they might have. Like, we also need to kind of check ourselves in terms of the presumptions that we make, because for me, what I ended up doing was tasking myself with interviewing members from all of uh, the ethnocultural, like ethno-specific LGBT groups that were in existence, many of them now defunct 20 years later, but at the time they were still present. So, you know, interviewing, you know, Arco Irish, the gay Portuguese group, uh, Ola, like Ola Latino, uh, uh, gays and lesbians of African descent, so on and so forth. And it's just like, I can't even speak Portuguese. I even, in, I even interview people from Avanti. But if I come in there with like the very, right, specific, right, right, right. But if I come in there with a very specific question where it's like, but I understand why you exist because I belong to a group that also felt excluded by the ethno formation of queer community in Toronto. Mm -hmm. Because we all emerged in the late eighties into the nineties at a very specific kind of moment where there were no services provided that were what we now what we now would call like culturally sensitive or whatever mm -hmm. and so that's my that's my entree i don't need to know italian like uh but if i'm in earnest saying i'd like you to share your story with me because i have one to share too i feel i hope that i'm doing the right thing that's my answer Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome, uh, welcome back to Unbound Questions, Ethical Interventions. Uh, we are now starting our second session, Colonial, Fa uh, Colonial Failure and Systems Analysis, or potentially retitled Power Failures. I actually like that title better. Our first speaker, uh, our first speaker is Cam uh, Camilla Ebrahim. Uh, and the title of the paper is The Limits of Antitrust Regulation, Refocusing Towards Epistemic Power. Camilla is a Master of Information, uh, information uh, a Master of Information candidate centering in human-centered data science at the University of Toronto. They recently graduated from the University of Waterloo with an Honours Bachelor of Arts in, uh, in Economics. She is also a graduate fellow at the, uh, the University of Toronto Center for Ethics, where she hopes to explore her research interests in the intersection of technology and the political economies of data collection globally and locally. When Camilla is not in class or working on her research, she enjoys finding new spots for gnocchi in Toronto. We have a shared interest here. Uh, Camilla, the floor is yours. Thanks so much. I'm so excited to be here and it's been so much fun listening to everyone so far. Um, setting a timer for myself so I don't ramble because I do have a tendency to ramble. Um, so yeah, like Chris mentioned, my background, my undergraduate degree is in economics. And so when we talk about economics, we talk a lot about sort of structures in the economy and monopoly is one of the ones that we talk about. Um, so in my studies in technology or in data science a little bit more broadly, I thought a lot about how when we talk about ownership of data, so when we talk about the ways that a certain amount of firms, so not very many and I'll, I'll get into this, um, but, but a very few, very few number of firms own almost all of our data, um, and the way that we usually conceptualize this is through uh, an economic lens. So we think about economic power, we think about market power, but we don't always think about what that means for epistemic power. So what does it mean when a couple firms are able to dictate narratives, are able to uh, create algorithms that are kind of entrenched in a lot of different way, different parts of our life? So that was, that was um, what I was interested in. Uh, I think especially in light of COVID with so much of our lives moving online, this event is online, um, it has become especially 
interesting and important. Uh, so if we if we think about context of education or work, socializing, everything is happening online. So that that data piece becomes even more pressing um, for me. So the stakeholders that I considered were Google, Apple, Amazon, and Facebook. And essentially what I learned is, or what I came to realize during by doing this research is a lot is that they're all headquartered in the United States. And I think that that's a really good way for us to conceptualize how that maintains the current geopolitical power structure and, and existing hegemonies. So from an economic perspective, a lot of them have been able to acquire monopoly power in the data space by kind of pricing out their competitors or by creating unrestricted mergers. So this is kind of, this is activity that we wouldn't tolerate from any, any other firm, but because tech is kind of like this new border and this new boundary that's constantly being pushed, it doesn't seem to have undergone the same stringent uh, regulations as other industries. And I think that that's especially true when we think about data and data ownership. Um, so that's kind of, where my thinking was when I was considering um, when I was considering this topic. So an example that I like to use is location data. So a lot of us or I mean, I use this every single day, but a lot of us use apps like Google Maps, right? And Google Maps tracks our data and then it holds on to it. So it knows where we're going, where we're interacting, that kind of thing. And while that kind of seems or it can seem inconsequential, that's about a $600 million market that they have almost unilateral control over because they are the ones who dominate the location space, right? Um, another example is uh, Nest, a company that was acquired by Google. And so they are in homes and they do like home thermostat thermostat. So it's like a smart thermostat uh, company. And what's interesting is that it's not the physical commodity that they're selling that makes them profitable. So it's not, it's not the physical thermostat that makes them profitable. It's the data that they're able to collect through those thermostats that makes them profitable. And so when I think about these things, it kind of, it brings up themes of, for example, extractivism, right? So we know that extractivism has long been a colonial theme. It has been something that has been taken from marginalized and colonized communities. And I think that that's also true when we talk about data, because when we are taking something from a community or from people or from users or consumers or whoever, and we're not giving anything back, that's a model of extractivism that I don't think is considered enough. Um, and then when we think about monopoly power and we think about the fact that this is like three or four firms that are able to do this in a way that nobody else is, it's an additional layer that I think we need to consider. So data monopoly was one part of what I considered. The other thing that I considered was the way that antitrust regulation can and cannot combat these issues. So when we think about antitrust regulation, we think about, okay, we're gonna break up this monopoly. So instead of having three or four firms dominating the space, we're gonna allow for competition, right? Um, and I think that that could be an important first step, but I don't think that I don't think that antitrust goes far enough. And that is especially true when we think about epistemic power. So like I mentioned during COVID, a lot of what we do has moved online. So a lot of the conversations that we're having, a lot of the interactions that we're having, our work, our school, whatever it is, is moving online. And so what that does is it moves very core parts of our society also online. So for example, the public square, the way that we air our grievances, the way that we consume news, the way that we consume what we think to be factual is now online. And because it's online, it's no longer public. It is now private and open to be commoditized. Um, so an example that I looked into was the way that we draw borders, right? So there's contested borders all over the world. There's contested borders in the Middle East. There's contested borders in Asia. Um, also, like, obviously, a lot of these borders have colonial legacies. But when we look, for example, when we open up Google Maps, we see borders being drawn. And the question that we then need to ask is whose borders? So whose borders is Google taking sides with? And what are the actual real life consequences for that on the ground? Because 
a lot of us, when we open open Google, we don't necessarily think super critically about it, right? I'm just opening it and, and it is what it is. So the fact that such few firms are now able to dictate what is true and are able to dictate what is a border essentially without international consensus, without us going through like the channels that maybe they're problematic, but that's okay. Um, the, the channels of border creation that have been established as norms, we're now giving those powers to a very few amount of companies. And I definitely think that that is a consideration for a monopoly power that an antitrust law that targets only the economic can't fundamentally get at. So that was one example. Another example is in prioritizing and deprioritizing content. So a lot of us, again, like we consume our news through online functions, right? Like um, I know my grandparents, for example, get their news on by the, from the TV, but I would overwhelmingly argue that my generation doesn't do that. Like I personally get my news from Twitter or Facebook or eh, it's mostly Twitter. But um, the point is that when we do that, there's this idea of like algorithmic amplification and prioritizing or deprioritizing content. Or even if we think about things like content warnings or content labels, it, it, there's definitely a place for those things because obviously misinformation is a problem online that we have to tackle. But I think the, the question and the epistemic power dynamics that are created when it's a very select number of people making those making those uh, calls as to what is true and what is not true online is definitely something that we have to think about and is something that we have to ask ourselves again antitrust regulations alone can't get at the core of um, the last case study that i kind of looked at as part of this research was in the way that banking and lending practices are changing uh, throughout the world so with as Canadians, we don't have as many online banking opportunities as other countries, but in a lot of other countries, especially in more rural areas that used to employ community lending models. So for example, in Tanzania, which was the um, the, content, the case that I looked at, um, community lending was something that happened often. So in that kind of an economic model, you are equally likely to be a borrower or to be a lender at any given time. And what we're seeing now happening is that monopoly firms are again coming in and are, are dominating the lending space. So now the average person is only going to be a borrower and is never going to be a lender. Um, and so again, like that creates a very huge power disparity. It creates a very different power dynamic. And I don't think, again, that an antitrust law alone has the capacity to combat that. Um, so yeah, all of that to say, I definitely think that there are ways that antitrust can be beneficial. So it can open up the space for new players. But I think that, and this was really what I learned by doing this, by doing this research, is that epistemic power has to be at the core of policy design or program design or technology design, because so much of our lives have moved online that we have to think about how racialized people in particular are being affected by the control and the domination of epistemic power. Um, and so I think, um, I, yeah, I think that there is definitely so much room for policymakers and for technologists to improve. And um, overall, yeah, I had a really good time researching this. I thought it was super interesting. Um, and I definitely think that there is a lot of room to like grow in this space. So Thank you so much to Vasuki and Chris for like guiding us and for creating this space and facilitating this because I personally found it to be really important and interesting. Oh my God, you're going to make me like cry on like YouTube. Come on. No, no, it's been such a, what a wonderful, like all the presentations are wonderful, but like, wow, this is like, I don't like the end of this engagement. <laughs> I'm now sorry. Have, because now I'm because now I have the task of introducing Dr. Uh, sorry, uh, Dr. Uh, Vasuki Shanmuganathan, who is a re also a research associate at the Center for Ethics uh, with the Race, Ethics, and Power Project, a dear friend, and what I like to call my partner in crime. <laughs>
uh, her research is at the intersections of race, colonialism, and health. As a research lead with the SHADE study, supported by Women's College Hospital, she examines the impact of shadism across racialized communities. Previously, she studied what constitutes promising care practices in Canadian long-term care as part of a national research team with UCARE, spelled Y-U uh, hyphen C-A-R-E, at the Faculty of Health, York University. Her current project looks at concepts of race and health in the colonial context and its impact on current policies. She is also the founder of the Tamil Archive Project, TAP. Welcome, Vasuki. Thank you so much, Christopher, for that introduction. Uh, this is turning quite emotional. <laughs> Um, I'm going to share my screen because I would like to present you with some background information that may be useful to you. And then I will start my presentation. Um, one sec. And there are just three slides um, uh, to orient you to what I'm about to speak about. Uh, as mentioned before, I usually study race and health in conjunction. And so I'm going to take you back to a time where you have aesthetic ways of reading the racialized body, as well as biopolitical ways of reading the body. The shift from the aesthetic towards the biopolitical uh, is always fluctuating. Um, and so today, what I'm going to talk about is uh, three pieces of literature. And I'm going to uh, just show you the slides so you know which ones I'm referencing. Um, and uh, I'm going to get started. So in the 19th century, German uh, writers were closely following French politics on the slave trade and its effect on different colonial regimes. Nobel Prize winner Paul Heise engaged with these discussions through his poem Ulrika, which is about a Senegalese child taken from a slave cargo ship and comes of age in an aristocratic Parisian household. Almost 50 years later, he returned to the same subject matter in his novella Medea, but this time casting a racialized working class woman named Vali residing in the German empire as the protagonist. And so for me, what was uh, fascinating about um, these particular texts was why does ethics require colonial failures? And so I want to also preface all these three texts uh, adhere to the racist stereotypes of their time, and they have very predictable plot lines. So the demise and death of racialized bodies, which in and of itself was a sort of um, voyeuristic trend that people followed. Uh, and when I say people, I mean the white European readers. Um, and what, uh, what becomes like interesting to, to scholars of colonial studies is also uh, sort of uh, unsettling the notion that colonial borders on paper meant um, that those were applied. Uh, but what I would suggest is these are not reliable. Um, and so in casting a racialized protagonist, writers such as Heise highlighted ethics to be tied to capitalism and in particular a comparative mode of colonial morality and politics. Medea is, is, is one such example and uh, how depictions of black characters become these sides of colonial discourses of violence, but also aesthetic valuation. Um, he's certainly not the first, so I'm going to show you a list of authors in case you wish um, to read. If you read German, uh, you can go and look these up, but there's also translations available online. Um, so as early as 1852, Heise commented on key debates around French liberal and racial politics, and his awareness was likely shaped by the several revolutions that Europe was undergoing and also repeated calls for the abolition of slavery in all the French colonies only a few years prior and well before the formation of the German empire. 
And what you notice within this particular time period is that advocates for abolition reported that French colonies such as Martinique in 1851 still were writing about the unjust conditions of the enslaved, indicating that the passing of the law and its actual applications were two different matters. And England had already abolished slavery on paper in 1807 um, and positioned itself as a sort of culturally progressive in comparison to mainland European nations. And you can see that kind of competitive narrative or comparative narrative uh, still playing out in the way that politics um, transpires on the European continent. What we want to keep in mind is that abolitionists, even though they were successful in bringing about changes in England and France, the ethics of abolitionism was more on paper. And there are two reasons why this was the case. So the European slave trade pathways remained in use and imports were legitimized by changing the language in which racialized bodies, especially enslaved racialized bodies were codified. So for instance, you have the Hanseatic city Hamburg, which is located in what we now know as Germany. It was the second biggest harbor for commerce next to London, which engaged in the slave trade from the 16th century to the early 20th century. Uh, and as um, scholar Holger Weiss notes, instead of uh, slavery dying away, the slave trade and slavery expanded. Um, and so you have the institution of slavery finding ways in which to redirect labor um, by utilizing the narrative of legitimate exports. And then secondly, um, while I'm talking about this sort of comparative and competitive mode of existence um, with between these different European um, nations, what I mean to say is when they were uh, engaging in the slave trade or colonialism, they saw themselves as European brothers. And that was uh, intimately tied through race um, versus when it was competitive, it was about the progress of the nation. And again, it was tied back to race. Um, Heise's work engages with this notably intercolonial literary debate through what I suggest is a representation of gender, class, and colonial failure. In particular, racialized women becoming the site for consumerist, racial, and spectacular, um, and the intersections of this. And the connection is longstanding. So abolitionists themselves would produce um, brochures uh, to inform consumers in England uh, by uh, illustrating that sugar literally contained the blood of slaves and thus invoking the image that they were consuming the racialized body. Um, what is of interest to us are three occurrences and they tie back to the three sort of instances that I'm tracing. So there's a literary lineage to the development of the character Bali. And the first one is that in December 1823, Madame Claire de Fort, Duchess of Duras, published a novella entitled Ulrika in France. Uh, her mother was born on the island of colonial Martinique, and the family had large holdings there. Her father was an admiral who was guillotined during the reign of terror. Um, and Duras' immense popularity in the Salon, uh, where she first told the story of Ulrika, became so enormous that there were um, two, two editions already in the first year and then nine subsequent editions of the story. Everybody who was anybody at that time commented on either being fans of the work or recommending it highly. There were translations of it in Italian, Spanish, uh, English, and German. And as you will notice, Paul Heise was obviously reading this work as well. Uh, and what was interesting is the public went into this sort of consumerist frenzy and took it to really new heights uh, with Parisian women wanting to be black, wear Uica bonnets, gowns and hairdos, good shows, and eat her likeness in the form of cutlets. The prettiest women, Parisian women yearned to be black and regretted not having been born in the darkest Africa, remarked one observer. 
a London magazine called, recalled rather unimpressed, um, at Paris, Ulrika is a kind of talisman that excites both the high and low and the rich and poor. All Paris is Ulrika mad. Its principal character is simplicity, quite different, and as we all know from the usual French taste. And therefore, its success is more surprising. In short, if it was not for her unfortunate complexion, she would be nothing less than a divinity. Um, and so this is what was happening in, in the story Urika, and I will summarize this because I would love to um, show you where the uh, sort of lineage starts. And Urika uh, comes to being to the backdrop of the French and Haitian Revolution. Uh, she's a, a two-year-old Senegalese child. She's rescued by the governor of Senegal and given as a gift to his sister. Uh, and so she grows up in this aristocratic uh, household and comes of age, and that's when the problems begin. Um, so she realizes, despite her aristocratic upbringing, that she has no chances of securing a marriage, and she has no chances of racial equality, because despite her accumulated privilege, um, people still see her for her complexion. And uh, so we, she falls in love with her adopted brother, Charles, and he, of course, um, the, the crush that she has on him remains unreciprocated because of her skin color and Charles's goals. So Charles is in search of a wife, um, which is better termed as a financial acquisition because he wants to recuperate the loss he suffered from the French Revolution and using his whiteness and aristocratic standing within Parisian society, um, he is trying to establish his own economic mobility. Um, Ulrika herself uh, finds herself uh, towards the end of the story in a convent and she confesses her story to a physician who is also the narrator. And so you see this typical narrative of uh, succumbing uh, the de death and demise of the racialized body in Europe. Um, Dura herself was mocked for being an ally to enslaved people. Uh, she was uh, mocked also to the point that she was named Ulrika herself. Um, and while you notice the hypocrisy of Ulrika's place in France is clear, the story can also be read as a triumph of colonial um, order in that her death or her succumbing to illness is uh, assures that there is no disruption to that sort of lineage um, of the European bloodline. Um, Ulrika is also someone who is positioned as a form of literary voyeurism into looking into the lives of the forbidden sexualized black body. And so that's something to keep in mind in terms of context. In 1777, also the King of France forbade marriages between black mixed and other persons of color on the grounds that blacks are multiplying every day in France. And that as a result, their marriages with Europeans are becoming more frequent and bloodlines are being altered. And here you can hear the biopolitical narrative invading a lot of these discussions. And so you're probably wondering, okay, so why, how does this relate to Paul Heise's two stories and the German Empire? And so what I'm going to turn to is a brief overview of Ulrika, which is the poem written in 1852, um, where at that point Paul Heise is 21 years old. Um, his best friend, for those of you who are familiar with German literature, is Theodor Sturm, um, who gains greater attention than Paul Heise does in the grander narrative of the German literary canon. Um, but what is quite fascinating here is, so Ulrika is his response. So among the many people who are responding to Ulrika um, as a piece of work that's disrupting a lot of European thought, he's responding with uh, his own poem. But what is interesting is he changes the ending quite um, considerably. So again, we have the typical um, narrative of Ulrika, who is a, a child that's uh, saved off a slave ship and is raised in a European household, in a French household, 
Um, and then you have the ending where she comes of age, she falls in love with Etienne, um, again, sort of disrupting the family narrative. Um, but in her profession of this love that she has for Etienne, um, she comes to a realization that no matter how progressive or how much of an ethics of equality European uh, countries apply, she will never be uh, accepted. And so she uh, escapes, she runs to the inner city of Paris, which is an upheaval. And in an encounter with a, friend, a fisherwoman, she realizes also that her clothes and everything she has on is actually the blood money that was paid for her when she was so-called rescued of the slave ship. Um, and so I'm gonna uh, go ahead to the last part, which is Medea. And so Medea becomes this longer novella, which is in part tracing uh, the genealogy of Black presence throughout the ages. So that's one. Uh, and two, even though it again falls into this narrative of um, seeing a, um, a Black woman grow up, um, seeing her do well, and then facing demise is quite typical of its period. There is, um, there is a particular narrative that Heise tries to insert that points to this problem that he, um, what I would suggest is he proposes that colonial failure is a way to ethics. Um, and so Heise returns to the myth of Medea, which is a very popular Greek myth. Um, and uh, some people also classify this work um, under Afroclassicism, uh, though uh, Afroclassicism as defined by outsiders. Um, and the publication itself proves to be historically relevant because uh, France signed the Abolition of Slavery Act for its last colony, Anjouan, of the Comoros, only in 1899. This did not uh, prevent the cultural policing on the part of British and French politicians and colonialists who cited German colonies to not have made the same progress in abolishing slavery. German colonial debates also revolved around the inhumane treatment of colonial subjects. Missionary societies were becoming vocal about reports on slavery and were pushing for bans on liquor and slave trade. These discussions were repeatedly surfacing in the German Reichstag, with, which is the government, uh, with policies being revised in 1891, 1895, and 1902 to curb the trading of slaves. Yet slavery remained intact. Slavery itself was not neither abolished nor made criminal. It was defined as domestic slavery and was left untouched for almost the whole of the German colonial period. And you have constantly reports on abusive col colonialists um, being exposed in newspapers, um, but the exposure in these new newspapers was not necessarily to shame them for their uh, for the violence that they exerted, it was that they were not adhering to a sense of what was the ideal European masculinity, um, which was devoid also of any discussion on violence and oppression. Um, and so this in the story itself to just summarize and then I will get to the end part of it. Um, uh, Medea, uh, which whose character is Vali, is a young woman who is 32 years old, working class. She lives in the attic of a house. And what she comes to experience is she's described as someone who is um, ordinary, if not, um, I quote, unfamiliar, foreign, ugly with a broad uh, face, uh, full pale mouth and nappy black hair, of course, invoking lots of racist stereotypes. And then the housekeeper uh, reveals in the story that she falls in love with a stranger who comes and tells her that she's beautiful, uh, only to be left pregnant. And um, one day she rediscovers that this, uh, that this man that she had um, a brief affair with, which she uh, is quite um, okay with, uh, is marrying this, um, this young wealthy woman. Uh, as his way out of economic plight. Uh, in um, 
in this rage that she has suddenly about her positionality within society, regardless of her goodness, she will forever be the outsider. Uh, she tries to throw vitriol into the bride's face, but stops short of it. Uh, when she comes to being, she realizes she's killed her son, which uh, has the father's likeness. Uh, and she's committed um, to an asylum where she lives out her days in madness. Um, and so for what I would argue is for these two writers who were um, sort of participating in a, uh, in a European slash global discourse on race, uh, both of them saw very clearly that co the colonial sort of standards and the politics that were is playing out, um, the ethics that was established within that narrative was an ethics of uh, exclusion of racialized bodies or the oppression of racialized bodies, if not the death of racialized bodies. And so for both of them, the only time in the literatures in which uh, there is some sort of ethical exchange or ethical positionality is when um, revolutions are happening or when the colonial society is a failure. And I'm going to stop with that. Thank you. And so the first question is, Tramello, in your talk, you discuss alternate, uh, alternate modes for economic support that are communal in terms of lender borrower relationships, what would it mean for such structures to exist and resist being incorporated into the current economic model that we're living in? Uh, because we can call that model capitalism, but I think it also means a different kind of name, but I might be hyperbol like hyper, uh, hyperbolic at this point, but. Yeah, well, so the case that I looked at was lending practices in, in like sort of rural areas in Tanzania. And so before like technology or like financial technologies entered, it was like instances of communal borrowing, right? So there wasn't, there was like rarely interest. Um, there was, and again, like I'm going to lend to my friend today, tomorrow my friend's going to lend to me. Like when I'm in a rough spot and that like it wasn't, a way for people to make money. It was like a communal lending experience, right? Um, that's very different than when you have an app charging you 16% interest daily on a $200 loan or like whatever it is, right? Um, and so what does it mean to resist? I, I don't know. I don't know. But I think, um, I think if we're thinking of very communal structures, I think there are lessons to be learned from places that have had these technologies come in. Um, and I think like there can be grassroots resistance. So I think if people en masse realize like, hey, these are not good for us and this is why, and we teach each other those things and we, we don't adopt them, we don't let them into our communities, we don't let them change the way that we interact with each other. Um, that is a way, but that said, it's really difficult to do when these apps become so ubiquitous and so integral to these practices, right? Um, so I'm not sure if it's like a policy intervention that's needed, but I think like as people start to recognize like the way we had it before was pretty good and like now it's, you're charging me interest and why are you doing this and that kind of thing. I think things will slowly start to materialize in terms of resistance. And to give you some context in terms of that question, part of that is that like when uh, in your paper you were talking about something that resonated for me because as someone who uh, is raised at, uh, as part of Afro-Caribbean uh, culture, a version of what you were talking about in terms of a, not even a lending model, but rather a different kind of economic model, we would call it a susu. Okay. And a group of people would entrust that if we all put in $100 and every month someone else gets all of that pot of money so that one month when it's their turn, there's a windfall. Mm -hmm. And so it's refusing the, like, the logics of like winning the lottery or whatever, 
And so, but again, it's this ethics of let's take care of each other to see, okay, so who has the most immediate needs that if we all put what surplus we have, they can accomplish and trust that they will reciprocate. And so I guess I just want to share that, that there's no other question there other than my next question. Uh, because another thing that struck me, because uh, I'm thinking about the ways in which, and I'm not sure if you do so yourself, that you start monitoring what you actually post on social media. And so the question is, is there room in your future uh, projects to consider the manner in which individuals form strategies regarding what content that they are willing to share mm -hmm. to make it unvaluable? Yeah, I think, I think it's difficult just because in the way that like, so much of our life has just been moved to this sphere, right? So it's like, that's kind of the idea is that like, if you want to resist, there, there's no like meaningful alternative, right? So think about even like this past year, think about if I wanted to go to school, I had to do it through Zoom. So, or like defer for a year, right? But if I wanted to be in school in 2020 or 2021, I have to do it on Zoom. And so there isn't really a meaningful alternative. You can be mindful of the way that, um, the like what you share how much you post like you can be mindful of those things but I really think like participating meaningfully in society just means that you do have to do those things um and so until we have like more robust privacy laws or we have alternatives like technological alternatives that someone builds um I kind of just feel like that's going to be the status quo thank you thank you and so um, moving on to Vasuki, I'm wondering if you could share more thoughts on why authors such as Haiza defer to the form of the novella, which I understand, and you can correct me if I'm misperceiving this, is more of a shorter literary form of storytelling uh, to indicate Black presence. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, just to insert, in Tamil culture, we also have the exact same system um, for the previous question, because uh, it's interesting, like, so people who have experiences with colonialism end up having alternative systems of exchanges. Um, but to come back to the question that you posed, so the novella is, is really popular. One has to do with um, just the popularity of the format. Uh, it's shorter, uh, its origins were the newspaper. Um, so you might remember Sherlock Holmes, for instance, mm -hmm. was published in a newspaper as Tiny Cars. And so the or earliest origins of novellas themselves were the short excerpts that would be published in several parts because one, you just had the newly emerging reading public. Uh, so more people were able to read to cost. So most people couldn't uh, afford to buy a full book or most uh, authors couldn't afford to publish uh, an entire book. Uh, and so novellas were another way around it. Now, some of the works that I've listed um, are also novellas, but there were other uh, works as well, which depicted um, black characters. It was just the popularity of this, peri uh, of this time period for novellas. And so the question that I was not able to send to you, so I'm just going to improvise it, because as you were talking, I was thinking that uh, the novellas that you're uh, referencing are also serving the purpose of the slave narrative that would be published. And so there's the variation of form and clearly a variation of how I want to frame this question because it's clear that there's like a different understanding of what it means to write in pursuit of abolition, which I think is what, uh, what resonated most for me in your presentation. 
that the very idea of how people understand what abolition looks like, especially in this historical period, which is now very timely for where we are now. And apparently we've got two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> or we can go over time and it's all good. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna try and concept. So I, I, I just wanna be clear because people who are not familiar with these works might go in search of it and realize, oh, wait a minute, they're not talking all that different from the European colonizers. Um, so I think the tradition of abolitionist literature that was pursued by British abolitionists in particular, who also popularized this idea of giving out brochures on street corners um, for this particular project. You have that happening. Then in the States, you have um, black enslaved people advocating for themselves. So that's another, and there um, the oral performance of speeches becomes incredibly important. And then you have the French and German writers. And we have to be mindful that Germany, again, was not uh, the nation that we know of today. They were different states. And so they could get away with a lot of uh, political, uh, wide political interpretations, so to speak, including slavery. Um, and this conversation that you have between France and Germany in regards to abolition is careful. Um, so when Dura tries to sort of um, even suggest that there could be another way out, she's accused of being an, uh, an Afrophile. Um, uh, and so what can be said uh, in German slash French context versus the British context versus the American context versus actually the Haitian context is vastly different. Um, and so I hope that answered it like to the point. It does. And it just reminds us that like you and I need to do a Q and A and a special event for the Center for Ethics for our August session. Yes, I if hope. You're, if, if you're willing. Yes. As, 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 as host, I am mindful of time and we are now at six o'clock. And so I want to thank the Center for Ethics for making these conversations possible. The Center for Ethics is literally where conversations happen, especially about race, ethics, and power. And so with that, uh, thank you, our audience, for joining us and sharing time with us. If you're doing this virtually later, Thank you again for taking the time to watch the video recording that will be posted on our YouTube channel. And with that, everyone have a good evening. <laughs>